Hi, hello and welcome to Alta Live. I am very excited to welcome what I expect to be a very large crowd for today's discussion on Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo's work and time in San Francisco. Today I'm going to be chatting with writer and Alta Journal contributor Gary Camilla. Gary is a noted voice um, in San Francisco for decades, and we're so excited to welcome him here today. I'm Beth Spotswood, and I'm Alta's digital editor. Today, we're going to talk with Gary about these world famous artists there and their two stints in the city by the bay in case you're unfamiliar with his work. Um, Gary has been a prominent San Francisco voice for decades. He is a co founder and longtime executive editor of the groundbreaking website salon.com, where he reported from the Middle East covered three Olympics wrote about politics pop culture art music and sports. Until 2018, Gary was the executive editor of the San, of San Francisco Magazine. He's the author of two books. We're going to send you links to those. Um, and his local history column, Portals of the Past, runs every other Saturday in the San Francisco Chronicle. He's the recipient of numerous awards, too many to list. Um, and he wrote about San, Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo in San Francisco um, and their San Francisco stays in the latest journal of Alta, in the latest issue of Alta Journal, which brings me to a little housekeeping that I do every um, episode of Alta Live. Alta Journal is a quarterly magazine focused on California and the West. We Alta Live is the digital interview series we do inspired by various articles um, that appear in the magazine that appear in a number of our free newsletters. Uh, you can join Alta as a member for as little as $3 a month, allowing us to bring you this beautiful magazine, as well as free events like this. And we also offer a California book club free to all to attend. In fact, tomorrow night, we will be welcoming poet and writer Luis J. Rodriguez. So I hope you will check us out if you're interested in what we do here today. Um, if you've got questions about Frida, Diego, and Gary, please ask them using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. We will try and get to as many of your questions as we can during our chat, which will last about 30 minutes. This conversation will be recorded, posted to altaonline.com, and emailed to you later this afternoon. Whatever email address you've registered with, we will shoot you an email with a link to this recording, links to Gary's article, his books, any other info that pops up that we think is relevant and you might wanna know about. So don't worry, you don't have to take notes. We will do that for you. In fact, our brilliant um, associate editor, Jessica Blau is doing that for you right now. Um, I do like to, to ask our community of audience to check in with where they're zooming in from in the chat. Please be cool in the chat, but let us know where you're zooming in from. Um, I am here in Nevada, California. Gary, where are you today? I'm on Telegraph Hill in San Francisco. That's right. You can't be in San Francisco without specifically stating where you are. Um, I'm. Thank you so much for doing this, and I'm. I'm delighted to welcome you. Can you? And I realize this is we're starting off big, but can you please kind of let us know? Um, Let's start at the beginning. In 1930, two artists arrived to much fanfare in San Francisco. We know who they are now, world famous Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo. Who were they then? Who were they then to San Franciscans? Well, Diego Rivera was already world famous at that time. He was uh, considered by many artists um, including even a lot of San Francisco artists who opposed the commission he was going to execute to be the world's greatest living artist, certainly the world's greatest uh, muralist. Um, he had executed many, many uh, big commissions in Mexico and was very famous. Um, he had only recently married uh, Frida Kahlo, who was much younger than he was and who was gaining a reputation as a painter, but was very little known at that time. She hadn't uh, shown very much work, uh, but you know he made sure he was the star attraction, but made sure to tell the press that you know she was a, a painter of no small uh, uh, ability. And the press treated her respectfully that way. And they were uh, given really, uh, you know, there was there was controversy. So the, the specific controversy that attended 
this first visit uh, that began in November 1930 was over the fact that Rivera had been given one of his two commissions in San Francisco was to do a mural in the stock exchange luncheon club, and uh, which was the bastion of capitalism. And he was a well-known communist artist. He had just been expelled from the Mexican Communist Party, but he was a lifelong communist of various stripes, a very eccentric one, but a very committed one in certain ways. And uh, this led to this kerfuffle in the San Francisco artistic community, which believe it or not, at that time, uh, when you read uh, stories in the, in the Chronicle and the Examiner, they actually describe the artist's colony on, in the 700 block of Montgomery Street, which is the block that now has the Canessa Gallery where the famous Black Cat was. And um, the sculptor William uh, Ralph Stackpole had a studio there. So that it was actually enough of a discreet artist's colony in San Francisco at that time that you could locate it in one block. On, right near the, um, the Montgomery block, the monkey block, where a lot of artists and writers lived. But anyway, these artists, uh, many of them, and not all, but they uh, were jealous, first of all, that a foreigner, even though he was a very esteemed artist, had gotten this commission, this lucrative commission uh, to uh, do this work. And then they uh, were irritated and thought it was inappropriate that this communist of all people was going to had been commissioned to do this uh, this mural in the bastion of capitalism. Uh, Maynard Dixon, who was a very uh, you know well known uh, local painter, uh, told the paper as well. You know he's the least least appropriate man in the world for this commission. He may be the world's greatest living artist, but he's not the right man for the commission. And they, there was an anonymous uh, leaflet that was slipped under the doors of the, uh, of the people that had given the commission and, and the press picked up on it. It turned out to be a complete tempest in a teapot. Uh, Rivera and, uh, and Kahlo landed at the airport. They were greeted by, you know, by press. Uh, the, the coverage was, was laudatory, was fascinated. They, it, they sort of took the line of, well, who is this wild communist? Uh, you know, and there was all kinds of sort of, you know, the tropes about he was a big paisano, you know, carrying a bird cage. And, but it was all actually very respectful. And, uh, and he was deemed to be un hombre muy agradable, a very agreeable man. He wasn't like this angry doctrinaire communist that, that they had been um, expecting. And then San Francisco society and the art world ended up taking both Diego and Frida to their collective bosom. And they were feted and there were parties held for them. And there was a big display of their work, of, of Rivera's work that was held at the Legion of Honor and all kinds of social events. So they were lionized and feted and spoiled. And especially Rivera, of course, but she was deemed very fascinating because she began to wear indigenous costume on the streets and, and she was, you know, beautiful and very, uh, you know, very diminutive. And he was this hulking 300 pound guy at that time. And she weighed, you know, what, 110 pounds or something. So they're 98 they were, in the article. Yeah, they were an extraordinary <laughs> um, couple in appearance. And the artists who had started all this, this big, you know, this, it turned out to be a tempest in a teapot. They got over it. Now they were all charmed by him. Nobody really, plus they didn't want to alienate any patrons that were, you know, might commission them next. And they also respected Rivera. So it all blew over quite quickly. And, uh, and Rivera ended up, uh, you know, having a lot of wild adventures. Uh, in San Francisco uh, during this stay. Um, well, I want to get to those wild adventures that, that, that made me blush. Um, I, <laughs> while we chat, just at the kind of onset here, I do want to share a few images as a, it's helpful to our conversation. This is, of course, um, Diego and Frida. I love this painting, but I want to kind of go through and, and look at the murals that we're talking about. I might have the wrong order here, and I want to make sure we go in chronological order. This is yeah, that's the, the okay. That was first. the first one executed. This is the one in the Stock Exchange Luncheon Club, now the City Club of San Francisco, and um, 
there it's a it's a beautiful mural uh in uh you know beautifully executed beautifully placed and uh there's a there's kind of a racy as there's almost always with rivera and to a certain degree with with frida Kahlo as well um there's kind of a some racy stories behind uh behind this mural uh the mo the raciest of which is that the central figure this is a depiction of the bounty of california so uh which was an excellent choice for rivera to do for the the stock exchange luncheon club because uh you know it didn't there's no, there's nothing particularly subversive of capitalism about this this shows you know all of the the bounty the fruits you might see the miners down below the earth as possibly a bit dark but yeah. in general it's quite tactful uh, and rivera was very capable of being tactful as well as being very untactful as happened in new york uh with the notorious uh, rockefeller mural but um the in this case he arrives in town and at one at a party he meets Helen Wills Moody, who was the uh, 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 a famous tennis champion, one of the greatest women of uh, female uh, tennis players of all time, and uh, she was had been dubbed uh, Middle Miss Poker Face because she was completely inscrutable on the court, and uh, she met Rivera, and Rivera was just uh insatiable in his womanizing uh this <laughs> this is not a secret and uh even though uh helen wills moody had only been married i think for less than a year they began having an affair and there's these uh delightful uh, descriptions of the two of them making this odd figure as they drove through the streets of san francisco in her little tiny car with Rivera, this massive man stuffed into the car and, you know, them driving up and down the hills. And uh, so he then, as he was wont to do, uh, used, uh, you know, he used her as a model and she is the central figure of abundance with the Who's enormous she? out of perspective hands uh, that are holding, that you can see in the, in the foreground of the painting. That's Helen. Who's this chick? What's that? She's the woman up on the ceiling. Look, I believe that she's she's actually I think depicted twice. I think that she, that the, uh, the 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 figure looking right at you, the the big head, it's also her, yeah, and, 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 the, and the hands that are reaching out and holding on to the bounty of California, as well as the nude that's flying on the overhead panel. Um, so. Uh, you know, Rivera, uh, you know, immortalized this, uh, this beautiful tennis player that, that he had this, this fling with in San Francisco. He did this numerous times, this willingness to um, include his lovers while married to Kahlo um, in his artwork. I'm, despite San Francisco's bohemian reputation, and it's one that you mentioned, um, in the article, even the examiner kind of offered kudos mm -hmm. to the stock exchange for welcoming a communist. Right. Um, this is pretty, pretty bold stuff. I think. How did? First of yeah, all, well, was everyone aware of? No, I mean, I think in those days it wasn't. You know, indiscretions, as they used to be called, were far less public. Um, there was. You can read Herb Cain's columns about. Um, about Rivera's stay, especially on the second stay, uh, 19, his 1940 stay. And there's some pretty nudge nudging that if you were, you could figure it out. There's a, he has, Kane has one column, uh, the Rivera later had an affair with the famous Hollywood star, Paulette Goddard. And there is some account in, the, in Herb Kane of Goddard having this very intimate tete-a-tete -tete with some handsome young guy and then Kane immediately follows that with some enormous fight between Rivera and Goddard <laughs> so it's it's a uh, uh you know there's kind of a little bit of nudge nudging on the part of of Herb Kane but in general I don't think anyone knew about the the Moody affair um and uh it you know basically Frida for her part uh, had a tortured relationship with uh, with 
uh, Diego's infidelities, which of, of which, of course, the most notorious and was depicted in the film about Frida was uh, Rivera's affair with her sister. Um, and you know, it, it, this, it, was, it was difficult for her, but she also accepted it to some degree. Uh, she venerated him as a genius. Uh, she was, you know, thrilled with his fecundity as as a as a painter, and there's some some have speculated that she was somewhat masochistic. I mean, she was a very mm -hmm. fascinating uh, woman of of great complexity, and uh, and then you know at at one point she divorced him, and uh, famously a San Francisco uh, doctor, Dr. Leo Eloiser. Uh, gave her what turned out to be, it seems, it's counterfactual, we don't know, but seems to be good advice. She was in terrible health. Her Mexican doctors wanted to do a major operation on her. She was very depressed. Uh, she had divorced Rivera. Uh, this is like in 1940. And he, Dr. Eliaser advised her to forgive, accept his infidelities and remarry him. Um, and that he said that's he was a very close friend of hers and she really respected him and she took his advice and they, you know, he didn't stop having affairs, but the, it, uh, the marriage uh, worked, you know, as far as you know, it worked in its own terms and it, they, they're kind of beyond good and evil. Uh, the, the, mar the relationship of, of Diego and Frida is unique and tortured, but brilliant and wonderful in some ways. It's a very, it's a unique relationship. Well, it's a very unique relationship. Before, while this is all going on, we have the drama of multiple affairs, affairs with um, Frida had lovers of her own, both she's a noted bisexual and, and right. um, had passionate affairs with both men and women, which she, in your, um, feature for Alta tended to kind of keep more private. Yes. Um, whereas Diego was open and didn't really care. While all of this is going on, they're being feted by San Franciscans. They're chic and fabulous. In fact, I wrote for an Alta newsletter. My grandmother had a run-in with Diego Rivera where he sketched her likeness in a cafe. Oh. And my great-grandfather tore it up and said that communists wouldn't be drawing his daughter. Um, but while this is happening, Diego is hard at work. This is the second mural that he did for San Francisco's Art Academy, Academy of Art. Yes, yes. This is uh, the second one on the first visit. Uh, it's a very ingenious mural. Um, it's called uh, The Making of a Fresco, The Building of a City. And so the two actions are ingeniously conflated and mingled in this, uh, in this fresco. So that um, the figure that you can see sitting on the scaffolding directly in the center with his capacious derriere aiming right out at the viewer is Diego Rivera. And How then do we know? Did he say this is me? Did he explain his artwork? Did he go through with his patrons or whomever and say, here's what I mean by this. This is me. This is my backside. This is the woman I'm having an affair with. Um, no, or are we I mean, just I, I don't figuring think I mean, it all he, out. He may have at I'm sure he was a pretty open man. So I'm sure he had, you know, open conversations with whether his patrons or whoever it may be about what he was doing in his murals. It wasn't like it was like this secret key necessarily, but um, no, I think it was, it was this, the fact that that was Rivera is obvious. You can tell by his appearance, by his heft, uh, he's the artist, he's sitting on the scaffolding and uh, actually his, pat his patrons are down below. Uh, Timothy Floiger is there, I believe, as well as um, uh, one of the patrons of the, uh, another, another major patron. And, um, and then, of course, you can see that figure who's got this kind of strangely, uh, it's got a very odd facial expression, but he's like the hero of American industry, but not totally heroic looking. So there's sort of a little interesting quality. It's not like pure Stalinist realism where that guy would look like he's just striding manfully forward into a bold new American future. But Essentially, it is a again a celebratory work. Um, it's not a it's not a particularly subversive work. It's not as subversive, for example, as many of the murals in Coit Tower, 
that were executed by WPA era artists who were uh, heavily influenced by Rivera. Rivera doesn't have any murals in Coit Tower, but the, you know, Victor Arnatoff and other artists that did do murals there uh, were huge fans and were profoundly uh, influenced as any muralist would be by this world famous, uh, you know, radical Mexican uh, muralist. So um, yeah, but this, there was one funny note about this one. There were a few people that still were like, kind of not sure whether Rivera, you know, about this Rivera. And one, one gentleman wrote a letter to a Seattle newspaper in which he claimed that Rivera was mooning San Francisco, you know, that he was like shoving his butt uh, right in the city's face. And that that was, you know, this kind of outrageous thing. But um, as I say in the, in the piece, that was uh, that literal rump faction was, was in the minority. And, uh, you know, the piece was well received as was the, uh, the, the one in the stock exchange luncheon club. And they left San Francisco on a big high and they were off. And then they went off to execute what most critics believe are Rivera's finest works were actually in Detroit. Uh, and then this is that, but we yeah, had now we'll, uh, we'll so they left San that. Francisco. They go yeah. off. He does work in Detroit. He's a, he had only done work in three American cities, yeah. New York. Started in San Francisco. Then he executes this enormous series of industrial murals uh, at the behest of Edsel Ford uh, Edsel, and, and, and does their really amazing murals in Detroit. And then he executes this mural uh, for the Rockefeller Center. And that they ends up becoming this huge uh, political confrontation and uh, and it ends up being destroyed and really a devastating blow for Rivera. It, it, it really knocks him uh, for a loop and it, it sort of ends his dream of sort of finding a congenial home in America for his uh, his brand of art. And uh, so the, the, he's so he's it's a much darker time by the time Rivera and Frida return in 1940, where Rivera then executes this magnificent mural, um, which, uh, as probably all of our viewers know, uh, was quite hidden away at the city college, at a city college theater, difficult to see, difficult to get to, much more obscure, and uh, uh, through a really marvelous uh, task of um, of logistics and art curation and engineering, because of course it's a fresco, so the whole wall has to be moved in many sections. Uh, this is moved to the free um, uh, Roberts Gallery in the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, uh, where it will be on display for, uh, I believe, a couple more years. Um, and uh, this is called Pan American Denver. Unity. That's its short title. It actually has a very lengthy title, um, but again, a, a really a fascinating work, and once again uh, has some really extraordinary uh, uh, sort of uh, depictions of figures that have fascinating backstories. Uh, is Paulette Goddard that we mentioned is uh, the is you know who he had an affair with is depicted in this right next to Frida Kahlo. Uh, Charlie Chaplin, who was married to Paulette Goddard, is depicted no fewer than four times. But the most interesting uh, figure, uh, it really is a figure who does not appear, uh, which is that of Leon Trotsky. Now, uh, Trotsky had been uh, Rivera's political mentor, a close friend. He, uh, Trotsky notoriously was under death sentence uh, by Stalinist assassins um, and was, had forced to flee around the world. Um, finally, Rivera, uh, arranged to give him basically the safety of his home in Mexico City, and Trotsky uh, moved in with him. But then there was something that happened that is not widely known. Um, it's reported in uh, Patrick Marnum's biography of, uh, of Rivera, uh, the, the, the second major biography after one that, that was much older by Burton Wolf. But uh, Marnum unearthed the fact that notoriously um, Frida, possibly as payback for Rivera having an affair with her sister, began a brief fling with Leon Trotsky, who was like 57 and she was 29 or something. There was this huge age difference. And 
And she, she tired of it quickly. Uh, wow. She just, she referred to this, you know, I'm tired of El Viejo, this old guy, you know, I'm really, he's getting boring. So she dumped him and uh, Trotsky was pretty bummed out. Um, but, <laughs> but then what is not well known is that Rivera found out about the affair. And, and Rivera, unlike Frida, Frida tolerated um, and even at certain point in her life was kind of titillated by Rivera's affairs. But uh, Rivera was infamously and violently jealous of Frida's heterosexual liaisons. He didn't have as much problem with her uh, same sex liaisons, but her heterosexual ones drove him crazy. Uh, you know, he, he chased, I think it was Isamo Noguchi over a rooftop, threatening to kill him. Uh, you know, he was, he was a very jealous man. And when he found out about Trotsky, according to Marnum, he got essentially manufactured a quarrel with Trotsky. He didn't explain why it was. And he claimed it was over political differences, which never made a lot of sense. And uh, essentially, Trotsky left his house which was, gave him this kind of de facto protection because he was sort of under semi-official protection when he was at Rivera's house. And then um, uh, Stalinist assassins uh, tried to assassinate Trotsky in a scene very weirdly reminiscent of that scene in The Godfather when they open fire with the machine guns and Al Pacino has to hide under the bed and they miss. This why this happened to Trotsky. Oh yeah, Godfather too. Yes. Yeah, they they uh, they they ducked under the bed. The assassins, which included the famous Mexican muralist Siqueiros, who was a die-hard Stalinist, as was the great poet Pablo Neruda. Um, although Neruda was not part of the assassination team, but the uh, um, they tried to they tried to kill Trotsky. They failed, but they and then uh, but this deeply unnerved Rivera because even though he had broken with Trotsky, he was unpopular with the Stalinist faction as well. And he also was under suspicion by the Mexican police. It was very complicated. So he fled and to San Francisco, where luckily Timothy Floiger, this uh, famous architect who was his patron and friend had, had given him a commission to do this fascinating project on Treasure Island called Art in Action, which would, would depict uh, which showed real living artists in many mediums working in front of the public on the newly created Treasure Island. And so uh, this was a very fortuitous thing for Rivera. He literally flew to San Francisco after hiding in a safe house. He fled Mexico famously with Paulette Goddard and another woman he was having an affair with. Um, he fled to San Francisco and then you know, undertook this, uh, this great mural that he worked on at Treasure Island. He actually had bodyguards. He's had a gun with him. He was afraid for his life. And when he was doing this mural in the summer, Trotsky uh, was assassinated by a uh, Stalinist assassin who had essentially seduced his way into the inner circle and plunged a mountaineer's ice ax into Trotsky's head. And um, uh, interestingly, this is the fascinating part about this mural is that Rivera, according to Marnum, was, you know, not at all displeased about this. He, uh, <laughs> Marnum has a long excursus on Octavio Paz's use of the word chingad, chingadar, chingad, and, and that basically it means, uh, I won't say it on the podcast, but it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's an obscenity that has a figurative, deep figurative sense, according to Marnum and Paz, uh, of, you know, it's like getting your, it's payback. And, and uh, basically Rivera viewed the killing of Trotsky as payback and he wasn't, wasn't unhappy about it. And it, it can be argued, there's, there's, it's a complicated issue, but this is why there is no Trotsky in this painting. Trotsky had just been killed when this mural was done. They do, he does depict a trio of evil tyrants, um, Mussolini, Hitler, and Stalin and Stalin, is holding a uh, bloody ice pick. So that's a clear reference to the assassination, but there is no Trotsky. Now it could be um, as uh, an expert uh, at, uh, at City College pointed out that he just wanted to avoid controversy in this, um, in this mural uh, because he wanted the US to enter the war and he didn't want to bring Trotsky in. 
But it could certainly be argued that he didn't include Trotsky because as Marnum writes, he literally painted him out of the picture and neither he nor uh, Frida Kahlo ever expressed any regret about what had happened to Trotsky. So it's a, that's a, it's a fascinating uh, sub theme of this, uh, of this great mural, which is uh, Rivera's attempt to depict the union of the two civilizations, both of which he greatly respected in completely different ways um, because they're indigenous peoples, um, pre-Columbian uh, uh, peoples from Mexico are depicted and the, you know, and mythical figures like the winged serpent and are depicted as well on the other end of the mural as all the industrial achievements of North America. So it's, it's, it's a meeting of, of the civilizations of the two continents with these you know, fascinating little sort of cartoon-like references and elements to uh, Rivera's personal life. Right, with all of his drama just sprinkled around there for pizzazz. Right. Um, so we've we've really covered here, and that, that I'm amazed that you were able to kind of like pull all of this together relatively concisely. And um, that's incredible. I do want to get to some questions. First of all, um, one of mine, one of you know, my question is that this this exhibit now. Um, Diego Rivera had there is San Francisco Museum of Modern Art has an exhibit running through it's called Diego Rivera's America that exhibit is running through January of 2023 the Pan American mural will be up until January of 2024 um uh, your fellow former San Francisco columnist San Francisco Chronicle columnist Leah Garchik recently visited and there were a number of she noted a number of kind of additional statements added by the museum that suggest reevaluating the way we look at artists like Diego Rivera. Very specifically, he had painted a woman, um, a, nude, a nude indigenous woman bathing. And the museum suggests that we rethink white artists, particularly male artists, exploiting perhaps um, eroticizing indigenous um, women. There's also been some backlash in in recent years towards Frida Kahlo that she had um utilized indigenous she had um culturally appropriated um indigenous dress artwork jewelry etc how if at all do you think we are to view um artists like these particularly Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo um who were active in the 1920s and 30s and 40s um, in today's lens? Do we, should we look at them differently? Uh, well, first of all, I should say that I haven't actually been gotten down to see the Rivera ex exhibit at, at MoMA. So I haven't seen the, uh, the curation uh, and the text that Leah Garchik is referring to. Um, but uh, as you characterize it, I, I find it to be a pretty problematic criticism. Um, it's uh, Rivera uh, venerated and was had great respect for pre-Columbian culture, and uh, as we saw in the in the Pan American Unity painting, um, the that painting that uh, Leah referred to, uh, I believe I know which painting that that she's talking about. Um, this is a profoundly respectful work, and in one that you know doesn't to, to my mind there's nothing about it that's exploitative or that is um it, and if it's sexualized uh, diego if you were going to start criticizing diego rivera for sexualizing uh figures in his art um, much of his art would simply go away um it was a driving force not just if if in fact you could say that it was the case with this indigenous woman but you know his his muses, um, his wives um, appear. Uh, so his, some of his greatest work in Mexico is all, are all based on on a, you know a woman that he just was profoundly had a profound erotic connection with and with her body. Um, and you, so if if we're to start saying well you you yeah, that's problematic that's the male gaze or what have you. Um, I think it's extremely, uh, I, I think it's it, in this case with Rivera, you're going to end up essentially putting these at these unnecessary asterisks 
uh, next to what in this case with the indigenous woman is is uh, the far greater and the important as uh, part of this is this deep reverence um, for uh, for indigenous people. And uh, you know, if we are to follow that, what uh, apparently is this cur curator's uh, com comments, the entire history of the female nude in art becomes profoundly problematic, which I suppose from some ideological perspective, it may be, but I don't well, really upon if consent was involved also. Yeah, if this right. woman is bathing and washing her clothes in a stream, it's different from someone posing for right. an artist and being paid for right. it. Or yeah. Him. Yeah. Well, but we're we're Just going to play. lose a lot of a lot of paintings that were executed like that too. Anyway, uh, so to me, um I I don't the, the law your larger point, I feel that um sure, if if an artist engages in some uh, depictions or some uh, has a point of view that really is problematic and retrograde, it's well worth pointing that out. Uh, this, this particular example seems highly uh, theoretical and uh, sort of box checking to me. So I'm, I, I don't, I, again, I haven't seen it, but uh, I'm not, uh, not impressed by that, by that uh, comment. Nor was Leah. Um, Sandra asks, many muralists have others assist in their physical painting. Did Rivera paint every stroke? And I think, in fact, in that uh, the Academy of Art one um, or the San Francisco Art Institute painting, there you can see other people assisting in the painting. How did that work? What was his team like or his process like? Yeah, he had assistants and, uh, and sometimes it was very... Um, very problematic. He famously, his, some of his murals in Mexico City, some of his most famous murals, um, they he had assistants execute whole large sections. And he was a perfectionist and a great artist, a great technician. And uh, he famously went back over and completely repainted all of the work that his assistants had done. And, you know, they were they weren't happy, but they, what could they say? I mean, this, this was Rivera's murals, but no, he had, he had important assistants that worked, worked on them. And of course, you know, probably most of the viewers know that fresco is extraordinarily demanding because it, it has to be executed quickly. Um, you know, and you, it's, you, you can't just sort of do it and then come back and touch it up in a different way. It doesn't work that way. So it's it's a it's a very living, breathing medium, and um, and yeah, but Rivera had uh, had highly accomplished uh, assistants that worked with him, including uh, I believe uh, Emmy Lou Packard was actually an assistant on the uh, uh, on the mural that he on Pan American Unity, and it was sad of her that she was the only woman that either resisted his advances or he didn't make them, but they they had a very uh, fruitful uh, artistic collaboration that did not extend into the boudoir, unlike many of uh, Rivera's contexts. We movie. have never had a topic that was so sex-filled <laughs> than talking about three murals in San Francisco. Um, a couple of people are asking, did Leah write about this? No, I just happened to follow her on Facebook and she had posted a photo of this um, kind of statement next to a painting. And of course the comments are, are full of opinions about this. So if you're not friends with Leah on Facebook, I encourage you to check it out or visit the museum and share the comments yourself. This is something that I'm actually seeing. I recently took my family to Muir Woods and there are a number of kind of additions to the history of Muir Woods that are currently happening. Um, did Frida stay married? Christy asks, did Frida stay married to Diego after marrying him again that second time? Yes. Yeah, they uh, remained married until her death. You know, uh, you know, tragically, she was in had terrible health and was in agonizing physical pain much of her life. And she even finally had to have a leg amputated and kind of lost her will to live. But um, no, they uh, they remained married. And when she died, he wrote it was the worst day of his life. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, as I say, they were larger than life in their romance and uh uh they it was a i think she was very you know happy that she i, I shouldn't say the word happy but it it um uh, it worked they she returned and they remained married michelle asked an interesting question 
Do you think that Diego and Frida's lifestyles, relationships, political views, marital discord, we've got the assassination attempts, Diego's got a gun at his side for protection at any time, contributed to their artistry, um, their creativity and their prolific art? It seems like tragedy and mental and or physical handicap, as you mentioned, Frida suffered throughout her life um, with physical problems, is almost a prerequisite for perhaps Michelle as famous painters, but I'll say, you know, the truly great painters. Yeah, I mean, I think probably the, the tragedy, the intensity, the eroticism, the fighting, the open wounds contributed far more uh, profoundly to Frida's work. And in many ways, at least from my perspective, there are apples and oranges, but um, she may well be the much greater artist than Rivera. Um, she, it's a different kind of art. It's far more personal. It's searingly, you know, brilliantly uh, self-lacerating, literally and figuratively. Um, she depicts physical suffering and emotional suffering and, uh, and artistic transcendence in a way that has made her even a more celebrated artist now than, than Diego Rivera. Um, so, but he obviously is a world historical artistic figure in his own right. I think that the, the, what the listener is asking about is, is see, you actually see it more and it, it shows more in, in, in Kahlo's work than in Rivera's. Uh, his work is you know, dealing more explicitly often with political themes, and or in a complicated way in a mixture of personal and political but it's they're not searingly personal in the same way that that hers is so but of course you know artists inevitably every artist their work is going to be um you know influenced by their personal life and um with frida it's to a really extraordinary degree we're going a little over time but we're getting lots of great questions i want to ask a couple more um, Judith asks, was there a fourth private mural commission in San Francisco? Is there a fourth secret Diego Rivera mural somewhere that we can't see? I don't believe see? so. I mean, he... Judith, if you know, certain, tell Alta, we'd love to break that one. The, I story. mean, when he had a vacation uh, at the home of a wealthy socialite on the peninsula after his exhausting San Francisco mural stint, I believe he executed a painting for that patron, um, but I, it wasn't a mural, I believe. And no, I mean, not that I know of, and I don't think you can, it's pretty, high to, pretty hard to hide a mural, uh, you know, as when the, when the people that write about Rivera, they're always talking about, he's like looking for walls. Uh, doing frescoes is about finding walls that someone's going to give you. And, you know, walls are big. So I, I, don't, I don't think so. Will Maynez, who is a Diego Rivera expert, who cared for the um, mural at City College of San Francisco chimes in. The Stern Fresco is part of SF MoMA's new show. So you can check that out there. Thank you, Will, for, for all of your help and um, my preparing for today also. Um, I kind of, I, before we wrap up, and again, everyone, we're gonna send you lots of links to this. This is a fascinating discussion. I am so grateful um, to Gary for taking the time and for all of you. Um, Gary, it seems like I'm a, a native San Franciscan, certainly a lifelong Bay Area-ite, as are you. We seem to feel a connection and ownership um, to Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo. Is, it, is, is there a reason for that beyond just their two stints? They're slightly like combined. I mean, it was a matter of months. It was like seven months here and seven months there. I, I don't want to screw up those numbers, but we seem to feel awfully, awfully connected and um, feel that ownership mm. of their work. Yeah. Why is that? Well, the, the uh, there's an obvious answer, which is probably as good as any, which is that we're one of only really two cities in the United States that have Rivera murals. I think there's some like sort of uh, fragmentary ones that are left over in New York that are hard to see, but they're not major works. And after the destruction of A Man at the Crossroads, the Rockefeller mural. So yeah, we, we have these three great Rivera murals and uh, they came here. Uh, I don't know that most people know that much about their visits here, 
But, uh, you know, there's that sense that these, you know, world historical artists and this remarkable couple, um, you know, graced our shores with their presence on two different occasions, nine years apart. And perhaps there's some sense of San Francisco being, uh, you know, a bohemian wide open town, yeah. which even as, they, as, as you mentioned, the Examiner and the Chronicle were you know, welcomed the fact that Rivera had been given this commission, even though he was a communist. So um, the fact that they, you know, were both, especially Rivera, who was much better known at the time, were these kind of, you know, daring figures politically and personally, perhaps that resonates with, uh, with San Francisco and uh, that we like to think of ourselves as being a, a wide open town and a place that's hospitable to uh, uh, risk taking uh, artists and, and in this case, uh, artists of genius. So um, that's, that's, that's probably the main reason that we feel that way. Sandra wants to know if you'll further develop this into a book. Uh, I don't have any plans to. I've got, uh, it's, it's, there are far more uh, learned and expert people than I am on this and uh, that, that have done, done all, done, you know, Sounds massive like amounts of research and reporting, but I very much enjoyed, you know, doing a, you know, a brief but fairly deep dive into this fascinating subject. So, um, yeah. And again, you can find that fascinating deep dive here in Alta Journal. Um, before you go, I would like to invite everyone. Um, thank you so much to coming in. Gary Camille, you are an absolute treasure. A San Francisco and beyond treasures. So interesting. It's so fun to talk to you. Um, we, oh, I feel like you, we Beth. could go on for hours. Um, I would invite you to Alta Live next week. We've had a cancellation. I'm rapidly trying to fill it. So there could be a surprise guest next week. We might jump just to August 3rd in which I'm excited to, to welcome Katrina Spade. She is kind of at the forefront of the human composting and green burial movement. So we're gonna talk about that. It's very much West Coast focused um, and it should be an eye-opening conversation. Um, but again, we'll, we will, this has been recorded. We'll send this all to you in an email later today. And thank you, thank you, thank you, Gary, take care. I look forward to seeing more from you in Alta and beyond. Thank you, Beth, a pleasure to be here. Take care all.